Let's go, Rider Nation. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, here we go, here we go. Get your feet in now. Hit them high, hit them low. Cause we're dealing now. Everybody's giving it all they got. Cause we're ready. This is the Piffles Podcast, your Saskatchewan Rough Riders fan podcast. And joining us this week, we have a special guest. Uh, as you can see, joining us here, if you're watching on YouTube or Sastel Max TV on demand, rider great, the legendary Jeff Fairholm. Jeff, thanks for joining us this week. My pleasure. You know, these podcasts and radio shows that I do, I do them because I have a face for radio. So this, <laughs> this all this YouTube stuff is not doing well for me, but here I am. Well, if I, we I, can do it, anybody can. Especially because you look like other Steve. Like this is. Yeah, you need you need a cut there, man. I I yeah. I, I, I have it by Friday. <laughs> There's a reason why I lined you two up beside each other, so people can c compare uh, what A and B. There you go. Yes, Steve, your opinions will never be as good as they are tonight for people that are confused. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is your Saskatchewan Rough Riders fan podcast. Thanks for joining us. Um, thanks for uh, listening wherever you find your podcast, watching on YouTube or SAS Telemax TV on demand. Piffles podcast is brought to you by our great friends at Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and SAS Drive in Regina. No game last week, so that, we, we got to fill the void somehow. And I remember a couple weeks ago, uh, well, maybe it was two months ago, we brought on Paul Apolise. And he gave us a little bit on his friend, Jeff Fairholm. Maybe uh, Jeff will give us something here about uh, Paul LaPolice. Let's get to the opening kickoff. Say his name and he appears. Steve believes in Chris Trevi. Steve believes in Chris Trevi. Cause they love him in London and Paris and Tokyo. America, Scotland and Canada. Uh, the look on Steve's face as soon as that happened. That I hate was, you uh, both. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. This is a Greg production. Oh, Lord. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Never, um, ever, ever tell people the things you don't like. They will They will take it <laughs> to the end of time. Okay, now it's time for the opening kickoff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to go from that. Um, but we will start, honestly, with uh, with sad news here in Rider Nation. I know it was a thing on the weekend. Um, former rider, offensive lineman Ben Fairbrother, uh, died in a motorcycle accident this past Friday. Um, he was with the Riders from 1997 to 2000. Went to BC to finish his career after that. Uh, the current offensive line coach for the Edmonton Wildcats in uh, the CJFL, um, and Greg, obviously, with you at the Thunder, you guys deal with them all the time, and you knew about this, and and just uh, just a sad story. Yeah, unfortunately, we found out uh, rather quickly um, what happened Saturday morning, as uh, he unfortunately did not make it to the walkthrough Friday night uh, due to that accident, obviously. Um, so um, the Wildcats and probably a bigger move than I probably could do in that situation loaded that bus on Saturday because they wanted to play for him. Um, so they made that trip down and we had a moment of silence at the game uh, for uh, Ben's uh, contributions to both the Regina and Edmonton. And uh, we played a, we played a football game and you can tell emotions were high, but uh, they did it for him. And it was, uh, it was uh, very strong to see. Yeah, just a just a sad story all around. So uh, kudos to the uh, the Wildcats for making the trip. That can't be easy at all, um, and playing that game. And and of course, our condolences go out to Ben's uh, family, friends, everybody that knew him. Of course, former riders. I know Jeff, you didn't. Uh, your career was done by the time he started, but still, it's a it's a fraternity, right? So when you hear stuff like this, like it's just it's gut wrenching. Yeah, it's happening too much. You know, it's just uh, as I get older, you know, I'm, I have unfortunately I have people that are you know passing away around me. But yeah, he is he was a young guy. It's just it, that's just really 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 sad to hear. And yeah, it's uh, it's not just a fraternity; it's a family. 
And uh, once a rider, always a rider. So it's yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a sad thing to hear. Well, we're uh, I, I, there's there's no good seg segue out of that, so I, I do apologize. But um, we're here to talk football. Um, Ben, love football, obviously. Uh, love the junior program as well, too. So um, we'll uh, we'll honor that by talking football here and uh, talking about his team, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Um, so, Jeff, the last seven games, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are 0-6-1. What's going on with them? <laughs> yeah, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Well, it's a tough one. It's You know, I get asked that all the time <clears throat> over the last several weeks, and I really don't have a good answer for you other than they're just having trouble getting out of their own way. Um, and I think we'll talk about what happened to practice today, but um, it's, it's just, they're having, they're having trouble getting out of their own way. And I've, I've listened to you guys, you know, faithfully every week. And I, I think Greg has been, Greg has been right on with, with his. Oh, oh, whoa. I know, what was that? I got to be nice to you now, Greg, because, you know, I, I, I was mad at some of the Thunder stuff and they helped us. It's OK. So, no, I think you're right. I think they're having trouble getting in their own way. I think they're trying really hard. I got a ding, um, which, by the way, you oh, guys did not get any. You guys did not get any dings <coughs> your, picks, no. your picks last week. Boy, no, anyway, we, did not. Anyway, we, 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 we took all chalk and that backfired on yeah. us pretty quickly. <laughs> I'll digress. I digress. Anyway. Um, I, I think they're having trouble getting out of their own way, and I think they're pressing too much. It's the old hockey saying, right, where you're 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 grabbing onto your stick a little too hard, and um, it's. I think that's what it is. They're a good team, you know. I, I you know, you can blame the injuries, but the injuries haven't really hurt them. You know, the offensive line, which I've been harping on for the last two years, is good. And this, I said before, this old line coach is going to be the MOP of the team because he's getting everybody ready to play. And, um, you know, that's not the issue. They're just not, you know, it's, you look at the first few games versus the last few games and, you know, first few games that are making plays, that's where they really built up that turnover rate ratio and they were making plays and, and, and getting out of their own way. And then something switched and all of a sudden, you know, it's completely opposite where they're not making plays or they're making boneheaded dumb plays to cost them games. So it's tough to say, man. It really is. You say they're a good team. Um, obviously, the record over the last two months wouldn't indicate that. But at the same time, f for 50 to 55 minutes of all these games, generally speaking, they're out playing the other teams. Yeah. It's just five bad minutes, five, ten bad minutes. That's that's haunting this team. And um, like, I I don't I don't. Is is there any one answer to try and just spark a team? Yeah, you know what I think we're missing, and I thought a lot about it. I was come as before I was coming on the show, and I think we're really missing Hardrick. You know, I mean, he when I saw nobody's really talking about it, but. You know, he's just, you know, when you get hurt and that's what happens, you get hurt and you kind of go off into the, into the sidelines. And we really miss his leadership, not just his leadership, but his energy. I mean, I look at Reed who kind of patterned himself in, in preseason and, and, uh, in the first few games when Hardrick was, was around and, you know, he was jumping around and excited and I don't see that anymore. And, and so, you know, why? Because Hardrick's not there, you know, big dad's not there anymore. And when you lose Willette, who, <laughs> For all accounts, he could be out for the season. Who knows? Um, you know, you lose a guy like that who's another leader. Um, you start to – it's hard to pick back up from that. So somebody needs to step up, and somebody needs to step up in the offensive line. I, I would look for Furlan to uh, to step up and start saying things. I don't know. You know him, Greg. You guys know him. I think he's a quiet guy, which which isn't well, bad. But. No, and that's it. He's, he's, he's not the verbal type. He's that quiet – do as I do farm kid who's yeah. going to come there work his butt off and he's going to show you how to do it. But yeah, he's not a, he's not a jumper. He's not a yeller. He's not a screamer. That's why that weird swing he took early in the season was so out of whack for him. That's, that's not who he is. Right. So. No, it's good though, but I have no problem with that stuff, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, but I think the leadership and, and I think what needs to happen, I think what is going to happen are some of these players are going to to step up as as leaders and be a little bit more vocal um and i do say they're a good team because they're not being hurt by 
by the injuries. Um, I, I think that they're, you know, they're like you said, two, three, four minutes away, one play away from winning a lot of these games because they're in them, right? So it's not, it's not like the last couple of years where we got down and you know they folded their tents and went home at halftime. It's a little different. So I'm still excited to watch the games because you don't know what's going to happen. All they need to do is win. It sounds so so so, so cliche, but that's what it is as far as I'm concerned. Well, so, you, you look at the stretch from the beginning of the season where we were winning games to what's going on right now. I think outside of that energy situation, the biggest thing is they're not getting any of the bounces. I mean, right. they made it, they were plus 12 in the turnover ratio after three or four games. You're not seeing that right now. Those little bounces that can flip a game and flip momentum aren't coming our way. And one of those in any of these six games over this stretch, and we're talking a whole different ball game. I think that's a big part of it too. Is they're just they're not getting the bounces, and like you said, they're they're holding the stick too tight. They're playing, they're almost playing not to lose right now. Whereas the beginning of the season, they were playing to win. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's playing not to lose is way different than playing not to win or playing to win. I mean, and um, that's one of the things that they're that they're not that they were flying around at the beginning of the season. They came out of training camp. They were flying around. They believed in themselves. Um, they had everybody on the team. Everyone was, you know, they had their leaders there and, you know, something switched. And I, I, I kind of want to point at the hard drift injury. I mean, it, not that it's his fault, but it's, you know, it's just one of those things that, that can bring down a team really fast. And it's, it's unfortunate, but they need to get over that. You know, they, they, these guys are professionals and they're getting paid to win football games. So it's time to turn the switch. And, and I think, I think this bye week is going to help. Um, I think what happened today in practice is going to help. Um, and we just need some more accountability. So going into this bye week, uh, if anything, Ryder fans over the last couple seasons now have PTSD, not winning a single game after Labor Day. You have people going, they need to get rid of this guy. They need to find this guy. They need to bring in everyone they can. I, I seen them say, Harris is out. Patterson's in. The season's right off anyway. Let's see what Patterson's got. What, like, Kind of leaning towards the NFL, Bryce Young got pulled or sat, I guess, uh, for being the Carolina Panthers quarterback because they're throwing these young guys in, in my opinion, too soon. You being a player and a coach, would that be better for Patterson's development or be worse to put him in a situation where it's everyone seems to think they're not going to win anyway? I think Patterson's in a, par- a perfect position right now. You know, he had a chance to learn a little bit. Um, throughout the last couple of years, I guess, and go through a couple of training camps with Harris. And then and then when Harris got hurt this year, he had a chance to go in and, and start and get some playing experience. And now to step back and continue to learn from Harris, I think is perfect for him. I think he's going to be good. He's not ready yet. I mean, anyone who says put put him in instead of Harris is, is, is seriously on drugs. So, I you know, I just wouldn't do that. I mean, you know, Harris is our leader. I mean, it's not like he's played bad. I mean, he, he threw a couple bonehead balls, like two I can think of. But, you know, it's like, you know, he's our he's he's one of our leaders. And I, I think I heard today he was quite vocal and saying he's pissed off, which is great. We need to be pissed off. And but no, he's I mean, anyone who says that, you know, take him out and put Patterson in is nuts. I mean, no, he's our leader. He's our guy. We're paying him lots of money, which is, you know, besides the fact as far as I'm concerned. But um, no, he's our guy, and he's he's played he's played fine. He's he's played well enough to win. What does this kind of a streak do to a psyche of a team, especially like as Steve said that uh, you know you're not getting the bounces that you were? How frustrating is that to to a team in the locker room? It's very frustrating. I don't know if you guys have ever had Suter on on this show. I don't think I've ever heard it, but you know that something happened, and I, I hate going back to 1989. It's what is it, 30 years ago, for God's sake. And but you know something happened in our in our year that year when you know Suter took two intercept or two interference penalties against BC and we lost a really bad game at home and you know we could have gone one way or the other and we chose I you know I I've heard a story but you know Glenn went into to John Gregory and said you need to you need to sit me and John said no he brought him into the locker room and said you know you guys want to sit Glenn and we're like no that's stupid so you know the team needs to to do one way or the other right now they need to. They need to try a little harder, have a little bit more fun, which sounds stupid, but have a little bit more fun, um, relax on the field, do your job, have faith in the next in the guy next to you, and move on. And that's what happened to us. We moved on, and we started winning games, and we got hot at the right time. This is the time to do it. 
you know, going into the game against Calgary. I mean, this is a <laughs> this is a must win game as far as I'm concerned. And you know, but the team's looking forward to it. I think that they, I think that they relish these opportunities. I think that they. Um, they have the right makeup and they just, you know, a, a team that tries too hard is a good thing, right? That means they care. The last couple of years, they didn't care after Labor Day. They couldn't care less. They were looking to pack their bags and go home. So, but now I, I think this team cares and I, and I think that they're still all in and they're still in a position to, to win football games. So you know, I, I think they're just fine. Given the so street that they're on right now. <laughs> Go bowling, yes. <laughs> Given the streak that they're on right now, would you would you say a single win is something that could absolutely flip this season around? That that's yeah. all they need is to get that winning mentality back. Yeah, to, to remember how to win. One hundred percent, and that's exactly what they need. And not only do they need it, not only do they need it, but they need it Friday night because they're playing they're playing Calgary, who's not the best football team in the world. And, you know, they're in the same, they're in the same conference and, you know, we need to go, we need to come into Calgary. I live in Calgary, so I say come into Calgary. So, but they need to come into Calgary and kick the living crap out of them and feel good about themselves and get the turnovers back. And, you know, Milligan has been a little bit, he hasn't played great in the last couple, why, why, at least he hasn't shown up in the last couple of games and they're probably not throwing his way, but, you know, we need him back to where he was and we need our, our, our defensive line to get pressure on the quarterback and put mayor on his back, you know, make him really uncomfortable. But that's that one win. This win would help a lot. We not only do we need to win, we need to win this week it has to happen. Now, Jeff, you alluded to the practice on uh, on Tuesday and that's where I want to go with this. Practice was stopped twice by Corey Mace. Um, first time he yelled at them on the on the field. The second time uh, it was after a drop pass, which has been an issue all season long. We've seen, and I know <laughs> I just can see your eyes roll there um, as the receiver. How the hell do you, you have one job? Catch the ball. Um, but he after the drop told everybody get that f off the field. Um, took them into the locker room, said whatever he said to them, brought them back out. Um, are you as a, as a player, not as, not as a coach, we'll get to that question next, but as a player, how would you react to something like this happening? Well, it depends if it happens all the time, right? If it happens all the time and you have a coach who's constantly yelling and doing these types of things, you, you know, at some point you kind of go, yeah, it's just, he's just fluffing it off again. This is the first time I've heard of this happening. You guys are closer to the team than I am. This is the first time I've heard it happening since training camp. I was at the practice when he took the team, you know, in, in, into a huddle and really laid into them because they were having, oh, I think it was a fight. They, somebody had a fight and they really laid into them. And the team had a great practice after that. I don't think he's done that until today. And I think this is probably the perfect time to have that. And because he doesn't do it very often, the players are like, oh, my God. You know, it's it's like when Roger Alday gets mad and starts yelling and screaming. It's like, okay. you know, that just never happens, right? And so you listen. So I think it's I think it's a great thing. I think it's important that he did that. Uh, the fact that it happened twice, that's kind of strange. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know when it happened, what stage of practice it happened. But it happened to me once when a coach brought – I don't remember. I think it was Matthews. He brought us into the locker room because he was mad at us and yelled and screamed and, um, you know, and then he said, go home. <laughs> we were like, uh, okay. So we really knew he was pissed off. But I think, it, I think in this case, I think it's a good thing. It really seemed to um, have a great effect in training camp. And I, hopefully it has an effect uh, on the team today. I think it's a good thing. Good timing's perfect. Now, as the former coach, do you like this approach? I do. Only because he doesn't do it very often, you know, and I think, you know, he's he's an old defensive lineman. He's he's got some toughness in him. So I think, like I said, if, if it was if if it was hap happening all the time and yelling and screaming, it just goes over their heads and they don't care anymore. But once in a while, it's 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 a good thing because it lets them know that, hey, I'm not your buddy here, guys. I'm your coach. And. And we need some accountability, not just in, in games, but in practice and how you prepare and everything else. So um, uh, that's how I would have done it. Um, not that I'm a coach anymore. I was only a coach for a year and a bit, but uh, in the CFL anyway. And um, no, I think it's I think it's perfect. I think the timing is great. 
Well, the team making uh, some roster moves, signing. Uh, I want, and I'm curious about your take on this too. Signing running back Rykel Armstead, who um, had a good start to the season with the Ottawa Red Blocks, was doing really, really well with uh, putting up yards and everything. Had those uh, penalties and blow ups on the sidelines. Coming into a team that's basically changed their culture over the last year. What do you take? What do you make of this signing? Uh, really short leash is what I would say. Um, I think they're willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, but um, you don't want to mess with this culture. I think they've done a, a good job with this culture and keeping players, um, you know, moving forward. Let's say, say that. And, you know, I think one one bad sentence in the locker room and he's going to be on a plane out of here. How, now, the other side of it is, you know, it's it's obvious we're bringing in some running backs, and I think it's important to to, to look, you know, behind the curtain there and say why, you know, is how bad is Willette, and nobody's going to tell you, but he's doing his community thing, and he seems to be moving around doing that, but you know, it, you know, it, it kind of worries me that, that he might be he might be on the shelf for quite a while now. Uh, when you start signing players, I mean, I'm still, I still, I'm still a big believer in Hickson. I, I think he's, I think he's a great player, but having someone there to challenge him and having that one-two punch, I think, is important. Riders also bringing in uh, some other roster uh, backups. Uh, well, back up to the CFL quarterback Michael Hires, wide receiver Trey Mosley, another offensive lineman David Murray, linebacker Braxton Hill, and defensive lineman Zion Tupula Fatui. I know I butchered that, um, so sorry, Zion. Um, but practice roster is expanded, and um, while we don't think much of these signings right now, this could be. This is exactly how Roland Milligan got his start in uh, what was it, 2022? Was he came in in October, got to play the last couple games, and has been an absolute stud ever since. So, hopefully, finding something good there. Um, but I, I do have one more question here um, on the opening kickoff before we, we move on here for you, Jeff. And uh, you talked about um, coaches blowing up on, you know, on the players in practice and what we saw. Demetrius Maxey tells a story how he was cut every single day uh, by Don Matthews. Did Don Matthews ever cut you? No, Don Matthews never cut me. So the great thing about, no, he never cut me um, in practice or any time. The thing about Don, which I really appreciate as a coach, is he he was a great leader in that he treated everybody differently. So he knew how to pull everybody's string differently. He didn't treat everybody the same and, and, and paint the same brush over everybody. He knew what to do. And he knew how, he knew me, he knew my psyche. And he knew exactly what I needed, which was nothing, to get motivated. And he just kind of left me left me alone. Uh, he would joke around with me and stuff like that. But, you know, that's what made him a great coach and a great leader because you can't treat everybody the same. And, um, you know, so, no, I never got cut by Don. <laughs> All right. Well, there's the opening kickoff presented by Kathy Feshton of Royal LePage Regina Realty. Let's jump to the Churchill Brewing Company odds and end zones. Let's talk Miles Brown. Um, he got the max fine for his hit on Chris Trevler in the Banjo Bowl. The league sent out a memo to teams saying there's a zero tolerance for late hits on quarterbacks when it comes to supplementary discipline. The standard for roughing the passer on the field stays the same, but discipline standard has apparently now changed. Um, what, Jeff, over what we've seen from Miles Brown over the last couple games with the, the hit to Zach Caleros and now with the one on Chris Trevler, What's your take on what you've seen from him? I think he's been. I think he's just been unlucky. I mean, he's getting he's getting pushed and cut and everything else into into quarterbacks, and I think he's been unlucky for the CFL to come out now and say there's you know zero tolerance. My question. Okay, fine. That's that's cool. But have they said that in the past? I'm not sure. So you know, it's not really fair. I. I <laughs> It's not really fair. I mean, the, the guys in, in midair getting pushed into somebody. I, I, hey, first of all, I feel bad about Streb and, you know, and, and having a bad knee injury. I've had that before. It's tough. He'll be back next year, but it's a, especially in, at his age, it's a tough comeback. But, you know, Miles Brown, I mean, it happens to everybody. And, and people say he's not a Garrett Marino. Definitely he's not. And I've met, you know, I've met Miles a couple of times and he's a, he's a nice guy. But people tend to switch on on the field too. But he's not that he's not that way. I mean, what he did to Calaros was 
Yeah, it was kind of dumb, but it was also overplayed. Um, you know, I think so anyway. I mean, he barely hit his head, for God's sake. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they're pulling him out. I mean, it's a little bit dramatic to me. But um, I think he's just getting unlucky. Um, I hope, you know, in this case, I hope the team pays his fine for him. I don't know how much it is exactly, but hopefully the team pays his fine because I, I don't think there's any malice there at all. I think the problem I have with this is now he's being labeled as that dirty player having taken out three quarterbacks this season when arguably the worst of the hits that he had was the one on Caleros, and it wasn't really much of anything. Definitely that one, I believe, was worthy of a fine. He There was head-to-head -head er, contact, no question. But this one, it's a short yardage play. His job is to go low to begin with. You know, That put Strebler in an awkward position of, of being hit like that add in the old lineman dragging him down and what do you expect in that situation what how is he going to get around that or get away from that hit yeah i mean there, steve you would have you you probably would have called that play to have strevler throw the ball that's a bad call man <laughs> don't have strevler throw the ball anytime so they put him they put him in a bad situation and then like you said you know getting getting cut or pulled down and having you know ended up going low what are you going to do you know, as a defensive lineman, you can't change your trajectory in midair. It just doesn't happen. I don't. You're not that good of an athlete. You're not <laughs> Superman. So, you know, it's just it's it's a tough one. The rule is what it is, and yeah, penalize him. And if you're going to have a zero tolerance, fine. You know, do whatever you have to do. But he's not a dirty player. Um, he's been unlucky, and you know, I believe in I believe in fate and un, you know unlucky. But but here's the thing: now that he's had you know three calls against him this year, I think um three bad calls it's you know he how's he going to be on the field now how aggressive is he going to be rushing rushing the quarterback i was watching a game i can't remember i watched so many football games but i saw i saw a defensive lineman go in and actually pulled up on the court pulled up before hitting the quarterback and the quarterback was able to escape the pocket and 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 throw a pass for a completion i mean we're, we're taking football we're taking football out of football you know we need to be able to hit people and these quarterbacks are not you know I, I agree they're important to a team for sure but come on guys they're not you know they're they're not a i don't know what the word is they're not a statue or something where you're going to break them i mean these guys need to be hit and you know the game is what it is and have people behind them who can play i mean it's it's just a tough game i i will My say unequivocally i would absolutely as a rider fan have Chris Strebler throw the ball as often as possible on us. <laughs> that is a recipe for success. <laughs> my my problem with this Brown fine is what took them over a week to decide that they were going to do yeah. this. Like they they should have fined him in the bye week. Like there, there's yeah. no rule against finding a guy when he's on the bye week. Now you find him just as he comes back to practice, and this all this is all he's hearing about. Like it was such yeah. a bush league move by the league to do that to him. Yeah, when I didn't hear anything for for that week, I was like, "Oh, he's in the clear. It's okay." And then all of a sudden, it comes out. It's just, let's see if y'all can't get it get out of its own way. I mean, that's you know, that's that's another thing. They're, they they have trouble. I mean, you guys talked about you know the whole all star thing last week, and it's just like, what are you guys doing? You're just making work for people. It's just it's ridiculous. So anyway, I don't know. They you know he's fine. It is what it is. But you know, it just it just gives him pause. Uh, the next time he's playing and and that's not good because when you pause as a football player that's when you get hurt so i hope he continues to play aggressive and somebody else's pain is fine we we waited a week for that fine announcement yet we're still waiting over two weeks for lucky whitehead to get fined for literally inciting violence in the stands <laughs> yeah that was weird too wasn't it it's yeah he needs to just be quiet and play football. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, I don't mind, I don't mind some of the showmanship that he was, especially in BC and he was, you know, coming into the games and stuff. I mean, that's fun for the league, but you know, just shut up and play your game. You know, I just, that's how I play. I just wish everybody else would. Uh, with the bye week, especially with a team that's struggling, what would Jeff Fairholm have done on the bye week? Would you have gone home or would you have been at, the stadium every single day and just grinding trying to figure it out well i lived in regina while i played and i lived in toronto while i played so no yes i would have gone home but it would have been a mile down the road um personally i would have been in for treatment 
um, you're always hurt. I mean, you've always got something going on. So for sure, I would have been in there every day. I would have been in the I would have been in the locker room every day for sure, getting treatment. I probably would have watched some films specifically on myself and how um, I could have gotten better personally. Um, I would have done it on my own. And I think I, you know, these days, you know, as far as players, you know, we never really had these bye weeks. Um, and I, you know, it's it's shocking to me that players get on a plane and you know fly to Mississippi and you know visit their family and stuff for 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 four or five days. I think it's a good thing. Um, they need to do that, and it's a different world. So, I think in this world, if I was living away, I think I would have gotten away for a couple of days. But uh, I think I would have, if I was hurt at all, I would have never have gone away. But I would have been in the film room and talking to coaches and how can I get better and what's going on and, you know, things like that. I always, I always, you know, even if I had a great game, I would always go to my coach and say, okay, well, how can I get better, you know, and watch film on myself. So that's what I would have done. Uh, I don't know what these players did, but hopefully the leadership there, uh, players leadership, were, were calling guys and say, if you're going home, fine, but change your flight and come home a day early. Was there ever a game where you watched film after yourself and you were like, hot damn, I'm, I'm pretty damn good at this. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was never, I always had, I, I heard something, you know, a couple of years ago called imposter syndrome. And I, I think I've had imposter syndrome my whole life. Um, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that's what kind of drove me. So I never thought that my job was safe and I never, never got too high on myself and said, Hey, you know, you boy, you really had a good game. You know, even when I had, you know, I had a couple of games where I had well over 200 yards and it seems like we always lost those games. And so I never felt good about myself because we lost the game. But so no, I never, I was, that's the way I played. I was just uh, wired a little bit differently than some, I guess. All right. Well, a couple of months ago, we had Paul Apolis on the show, as we mentioned. You guys coached together, uh, in his words, for about a few weeks in Toronto before uh, you left. Um, you did work with him. Like he said that you guys worked for months. So obviously putting game planning and, and his coaches do before the season. Um, what was Paul Lapolis like back then as a first? That was his first year, I think. Uh, yeah, he year. was green. Yeah, he was really green. He didn't understand the game at all. I mean, he, you could tell, I mean, he, we became pretty good buddies because the rest of the staff was just a gong show. Um, the John, John Eward as a head coach and J.I. Albrecht as the GM. And I mean, it was a gong show. I mean, it really was. It was terrible. And um, it got to a point where, you know, I was talking to Paul and Paul would be like, well, what are we going to do? And, you know, our offensive scheme was, it was nothing like we had no offensive scheme it was it was brutal and so paul and i would look at each other and i would go well i used we used to do this and he'd say well what did the quarterback read and i said i don't know <laughs> i was coaching receivers i don't know um and i was a receiver on our plate so it was just a, an odd odd time and we became pretty good friends because we were able to sort of talk to each other and you know bounce things off of each other and um, he was really good friends with Heward. That's how he got in there was because Heward um, brought him in from the States. And, you know, you, you could tell he had a really, really good mind. Um, there's a lot of things that happened there that I, you know, I, I could tell you the stories, but I, I couldn't I couldn't stand it any longer. And I, I blew up in a meeting and went out and called Perry Lefko and said, uh, you need to interview me. He says, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And I said, because you know, it was forbidden. Right. They, Albrecht and Heward were like, they said, you're not allowed as assistant coaches. You're not allowed to talk to the media. And I said, I know I <laughs> come interview me right now. And I got fired the next day. So, you know, I wanted out of there. I couldn't wait to get out. They were just, oh, my God, they were belligerent to the players. And I was just too, you know, I wasn't too far removed from being a player. So I couldn't handle it anymore. And with that, talking about, you know, being just just removed from playing and getting right into coaching um do you find that's a, a not necessarily an issue but is is that something that uh i don't know how to word it how, how important is it to have i guess younger coaches that can relate to the player that you know they played with a couple of years ago um as yeah. opposed to i mean we saw head coaches are getting younger and younger and younger yeah. um but there's still you know the the old school you know yeah. Coaches Andy Reid's of the Andy Reeds of the of the world, yeah. Um, I mean, you have to have the right personality, and 
Um, the younger the younger coaches can certainly relate to the players, but there's a fine line. You know, you don't want to be their friend. And just like Mace did, just like Mace did today, you know, like, hey, I'll pat you on the back. I'll give you a hug. You know, I think I saw was it, uh, McDaniels giving to a kiss on the way out. That's all cool. You know, that's all genuine. But you need to be able to flip the switch and go the other way. So there's a fine line. If you're too early on in your career, if you're just out of coaching, so you know you, you've got to really play that game because you, you really step into a completely different world. And that world I didn't really like, and that's why I got it wasn't just the Ewer thing and the reason why I got out. I mean, I really I was under Barker my first year, and I really didn't enjoy that either because um, I saw a lot of things that were said to players, and then you go into the back rooms and completely opposite things are said and they're you know mf in this and mf and that and i'm like i'm like okay is this really what happens i don't want any part of this i mean i'm real i tell the truth and i just didn't want to i just didn't like it so um but maybe i was too you know too closely removed from coaching or sorry from playing what did you learn about yourself as a coach um I learned that's a good question. I learned a lot actually. I learned how to to deal with people who are quote unquote, you know, um, reporting to me. So I've I learned a lot about my 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 life and in sales and working with other people. And you know, uh, I love coaching. I coached my son for years, and I I I learned how to how to teach. Um, I learned how to communicate. I learned how to win. I learned learned how to lose. I learned how to motivate. So there's a lot of things that I took out of that, out of that year and a bit where, you know, I use it, you know, still today when I'm, when I'm working, working as I do. And now you see Paul Apolis uh, doing stuff on the sidelines, doing uh, great analyst work. Uh, yeah, I, really think I, I love watching games where he's the color commentator. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously being friends with him. Um, what's it like seeing him go from a coach to to this uh, analyst and would you like to see him become a coach again? I want him to do whatever he wants to do. He, he's a great guy. Uh, he has a great family, great family man. And he means what he says. I mean, that's what I love about him. He's real, right? Like when he says something, he's absolutely meaning it when he's laughing and he's having a good time when he's, when he's mad, he's, he's mad. And it's not hard to figure that out with him, which is what I love. And I'm sure I never played for him, obviously, but I'm sure the players that played for him knew where he was coming from, which is all you could ask for. And that, that's what it was like with Don Matthews for us. I mean, you knew where he was coming from. He told you, you know, he flew off the hip. Um, and Paul's, I'm just really proud of Paul. I mean, he's, you know, it sounds stupid because we're pretty much, oh, he's a little younger than me, I guess. But, you know, I, I'm proud of him because he's he's made a career. He's stuck with it. He loves the game. Um, he's all in on the CFL. And as an analyst, man, I think he's great. I learned stuff when he's talking about it. And, you know, you think you know everything, but you don't. But, you know, he's got a, he's got a great football mind. And he's a great communicator. And he's just, you know, would I like to see him be a coach? I don't know. I just want him to do what he wants to do. I mean, it'd be tough for him to, you know, move his, move his family at this point. So, um, no, he's doing great. I love him. He's great. And there's a fine line in comment and commentating where you can be really insightful like him, but still kind of dumb it down to the super casual viewers to uh, to have them yeah. understand it. So I think he's doing a very good job doing that. So yeah, and and, and he did that coaching too. There. Yeah, he did that coaching too. He was a great teacher. Um, he had quarterbacks. I had receivers. I think he had running backs too. And you know, we, we obviously we spent a lot of time together. And he he explained a lot. And you know, he was learning. And he would learn and he would he would coach the players and teach the players. So he he's a very quick learner, but he's a very good communicator. All right. Well, let's look at this uh, game coming up on Friday. Riders in Calgary to face the Stamps, as you said, and I'm sure all three of us agree a must win game for the Riders just to get their their heads back on straight and just make this push for the playoffs here. Um, Anthony Lanier back practicing, won't play against Calgary though. Uh, Jacob Brammer on the offensive line, pr again, practicing, but with the backups, um, finally starting to get some, some bodies back. No AJ Ouellette, no Dante Myers. Um, Nick Weeb actually linebacker, um, had to be helped off by teammates in practice today. And I, I do have a question for you, Jeff, about that. When you see a young guy who comes back from a serious injury like he had in college finally gets to play a game and then gets hurt in practice 
what does that do to a locker room when you see a guy you know fight so hard to get and live his dream and then in practice gets hurt yeah it takes the air out of you for sure um you know it just, if you had a if you had an excitement in the air it certainly goes away really quick anybody when anybody gets hurt i mean he fought so hard to get back and i know what it's like to come back from that acl injury and it's it's really hard and it's hard on your head as hard as it is physically and yeah, i don't know what the injury is hopefully he's fine uh, but you know <laughs> if you're carrying if you're helped off the field by players that's that's never a good thing but yeah, I wish him the best. I don't know. I don't know what to say. It's 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 tough on the team, and they just keep getting knocked back, right? So, you know, um, you know, somebody gets fined, somebody gets hurt, the coach has to get mad. Yeah, it's, it's a lot to take in on a team that's already lost, you know, whatever it is, six, seven games. So, um, but yeah, it's tough on a team. Well, Mike, my, my concern is, and you're kind of right, alluding to it, is he came back from that injury, one game in. And he's down again. Like as a young player, that's got to be hard to process. That your yeah. career might be over before it begins. Like you, you kind of have to think about that if you. If it is a similar injury to his college one. Yeah, his it, the thought will certainly enter his mind. But you know, once you once you settle down, it gets diagnosed and a plan gets in place as to what's what's got to happen. Then you, you know, as a professional athlete, which he is, you know, he's a professional athlete now. He. You know he'll he'll settle down he'll say okay this is what i gotta do and he'll make a plan and he'll do it um he won't he won't look at retirement I hope um i don't know what what we're, we're, we're you know we don't know what the injury is so hopefully it's not too bad but he'll you know he'll give it another shot for sure um he'll fight through it he's too young not to um this is obviously his dream he's too good a player not to not to step back in is this game against the stampeders coming up exactly what the doctor prescribed to get the season back on track because i look across i see calgary and jeff you listen to the show i've been harping on jake mayer for the last couple of years saying he is me not too guy, right <laughs> me too yeah so i not, mean i'm not just making things up here but like no they they I, I, I see a team that's not good in calgary has shown some flashes only at home but i think every team kind of does that the riders on paper should wipe the floor with them. Just when I look at rosters, when I look at how the makeup of the team is, but I, 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 I can't see them doing that. You can't see them wiping the floor with them. No, they've been hmm. in, they've been tight games every single game they've been in. And I just, I, I can't see that right now. I think we're going to, I, my prediction, my crystal ball is no clearer than yours. Um, my prediction is we're either going to blow them out or we're going to lose. <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's my prediction, um, which, which doesn't say much, I guess, but, and you said, is this just what the doctor ordered at this time? And I kind of started thinking maybe if we win, <laughs> no, but it could be exactly what we don't need if we lose. Right. So, that's you know, true. that's why he played the games. I mean, they, they tied Montreal. So, you know, they've got something right. And hopefully they, Hopefully they gave everything they had to Montreal and they, you know, they take us lightly, but uh, the crowd will be good for Saskatchewan. There's always tons of, Saskatch of Saskatchewan fans there. Um, it's going to be half and half. And, you know, like I said before, this is a must win. Uh, there's no, there's no bones about it. I hate to say it, but you know, this win is the season right now. The, the thing that scares me the most about this game is if you look at the 2024 Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and you look at them and the, they are the picture definition of playing to the level of their competition. They play up to teams like BC and Montreal, and they play down to teams like Hamilton and Edmonton to start the season. I, I worry that they try to play down to Calgary's level and, you know, can't rise above that enough to, to have that blowout win that I agree with you. They absolutely need in this, in this scenario. Yeah. It, it, it's, um, it's one of those things where you never try to play down to your to, to your team to another team, but it happens. I, I understand what you're saying, um, but this is a, this is a different situation. If we had won a game in the last few, I would say there's a chance that could happen, and it still might. But we're not in that situation. This is these are desperate times right now, and uh, I think that's why Mace went off on them today because these are desperate times, and. Um, you know, the team needs to show up and they need to do whatever they can. How, yeah, but, you know, don't grab the stick too hard, right? Just play your game. 
you know, trust the people around you, you know, try to have a little bit of fun and, you know, get up early, you know, get up early so that you can relax, get some breaks going your way. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of fate and a lot of luck that goes on in these games too. And we're due, um, boy, are we due. And, you know, and like I said, last year, I kept saying it too, we're due, we're due, but you know, nobody had any faith in that team because we were mailing it in. I had faith in this team because they're not, that they're, they're still playing hard and they're still in every game. So, I'm going to, you know, I don't know what the line is. I know you guys are going to get to that, but um, I hope it's, you know, I don't care what the line is. I'm taking Saskatchewan to win. So that's where I, my I've, hope is. I've heard a lot of people refer to this game as a trap game. And the one question I have is, is it a trap game for who? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Both teams are going into this. They have to be thinking we should win this game. Saskatchewan is the better team on paper, but Calgary is looking at the riders going, they haven't won a game in two months. Oh. Yeah, it's not a it's not a trap game. A trap game was BC losing to Toronto last week. That's a trap game. Uh, this ain't a trap game. This is this is uh, all hands on deck. You know, both teams are fighting for their lives. This feels like a picture perfect Danny Barrett game. Like we're, I I can't decide. Like you're right. We're either going to win by a lot. Or we're going to lose it somehow. That's the only way I see it. Yeah, hopefully not. Hopefully it goes. Hopefully it goes. Uh, you know, we win by a lot. But uh, you know, that's why you play the game. So. One bounce here and there could could cause it, like or two or three minutes, like you said before, Alex. So for the riders on offense, what do they need to do to just survive those couple lapses that they've been having, the drops? What what do you see from this riders offense that they should be doing to win this game? It, it goes back to basic blocking and tackling. So you know, uh, simple it down. You know, put in a couple wrinkles that you that you want to have against Calgary, but run the ball. Let the offensive line establish establish the line on, on their side. Uh, we need to run the ball. We need to establish the run. We need to get the ball out of out of Harris's hands. We got to catch the ball. I mean, it's just basic blocking, tackling, catching. You saw me roll my eyes when you see block, drop passes. I mean, it makes me crazy. I mean, these guys aren't getting paid millions of dollars, but you know, when, when the guys in the NFL drop it, I, I you know, I have no hair to pull out. But if I did, I would. Um, you know, it's just basic blocking and tackling, you know, make the right reads, um, it, you know, uh, do your job, make sure you don't make any, any, you know, mental mistakes, stay out of penalties and protect the ball. And on defense, completely the opposite, you know, don't make mistakes, but you gotta, you gotta create turnovers and get back to that, get back to that turnover ratio that we're famous for earlier in the year. I mean, it's basic blocking and tackling. I hate to be so cliche, but that's what it is. I want to get your take on Mark Mueller's um, offense right now, but specifically in the run game, because I'm finding it very predictable when I see a Joe, a Joe come in and line up as tight end, or when the receivers are out split out wide and they come in to block, you know, it's going to be a run play every single time. It seems like there's no creativity there. Um, what, what's your take on, on what you've seen from the offensive play calling in the run game? I think I think when they do that now, they're doing it to protect the offensive line. You got to remember how many offensive linemen have we played this year? You know, so I think they're helping the offensive linemen a little bit. Um, but you're right; it is somewhat predictable. So hopefully, in the bye week, they've come up with some schemes where you know, because other teams see it. If you, if you if you and I see that, then then teams are certainly seeing it on on film. So um, you know, I'd like to see some wrinkles out of that. Use that to your advantage, and you know. Um, get a big player to by by not running the ball in those situations and you know you know splitting somebody out or you know go into block and you know run deep i don't know it's not my job to figure it out it's theirs but they've had you know they'll have two weeks to figure that out so i hope to see some wrinkles in this game and then the flip side on defense um obviously getting some turnovers um yeah. <laughs> i hate the soft zone i hate it hate yeah. it hate it Richie Hall around that defense, the bend but don't break. And it does provide some success when you're holding teams to field goals. That's that's fine and all. But when it's big play over the middle up again and again, and you know it's going to be, you know, Nick Dembski over the middle, it's going to be wide open. Yeah. To me, like, yeah, those to me, players are frustrating. Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, I again, I'm watching it on TV. I haven't been to a live game yet. You guys have, so you know more than I do. And they, it seems to me they're playing that soft zone. And it, when you get players like Dembski, like uh, McKinnis in BC, uh, you know, I mean, he killed us, right? Playing, in, you know, just finding those open zones. I mean, a guy like Elgar would find those open zones and would kill you. Um, 
I'd like to see us mix it up and maybe we do, you know, maybe, maybe since all gloves are off, maybe we will, maybe we will come a little bit more and, and blitz and play a little bit more, man. Don't know. Um, but yeah, that soft zone is, is, is bugging me too. And there's a lot, and it's a big field and there's a lot of holes in there and if receivers can find it, um, you know, they're going to make big plays. And if you only, if you have one mistake in the, in the secondary and we've seen it happen this year, that's when big plays happen against you. So, you know, I think, you know, it seems to me that their defensive philosophy is built around getting pressure on the quarterback um, and not allowing those zones to open up. Um, it hasn't, you know, it's worked in some, in some situations, but in some situations it hasn't. So I'd like to see him mix it up a little bit personally. Well, bend and don't break and holding the field goals works well, but only if you're scoring too. And they've been having trouble putting points yeah. on the board. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a team game, right? And, and then, you know, then you have some, and you have some issues on special teams too, which has hurt us. And, you know, let's not forget special teams where, you know, we, we, we missed four field goals and we, we muffed a punt and, you know, things like that, that have hurt us, you know, down the stretch in games. So it's just, it's, it seems like everybody's taking a turn. So, you know, of doing the wrong thing. So we just need to, to like I said, get back to basics. Uh, I'm sure that's what they're stressing. They have to be. Uh, they're stressing that. Let's go back to training camp where we were and, um, you know, get right. Well, and that bend right. but don't break defense was working fantastic again at the start of the year when they were also getting turnovers. Right. You know, they and, they weren't and, even giving up the field goals. They were committing, getting turnovers game after game after game. Yeah. And that flipped the field. They're not getting that now. Well, that's right. And coming out of training camp, especially with how little people play or starters play in, in preseason these days, you know, coming out of training camp, defenses are always ahead of, of offenses. It takes offenses a little while to figure it out. Um, so I think what you're seeing is our defense came out and, and played really well because offenses weren't quite there yet. And coaches have figured us out. And, you know, I don't know. I don't, like I said, I don't watch film. And I don't, they, they have a lot of analytics and a lot of tendencies that they can see now. And, and um, you know, I, I think, I think some offenses have figured us out. So we need to change up. I mean, you can't just, you know, what's that old saying? You can't keep doing the same old thing and um, expecting different results. So we need to change things up and, you know, but also get back to basics. All right. Well, let's. Uh, you said you're going to take the Riders no matter what they're they're uh, favored by or whatever the spread is, anyway. So let's uh, let's get to our picks. Piffles picks. Well, folks, when you're right fifty two percent of the time, you're wrong forty eight percent of the time. I'd uh, I'd settle for being wrong only forty eight percent of the time right now. Uh, with <laughs> I was so close. So how close. bad last week was. Um, it's a crazy, so, it's a, it's a crazy league, isn't it? I mean, look what happened last week. It's just anybody can beat anybody at any time. That's what I loved about this league. And actually, that's uh, that's one thing that we kind of threw out in uh, our DM chat that we have is, I think the CFL has finally hit what every single pro sports league wants, and that's parity, where it really is, you know, any given Sunday or Friday or Saturday, I guess, but. Any team can beat any team, and you look at the worst team in the league in the standings anyway, Hamilton and, and Calgary, they're only a couple games back. So theoretically, if they can get hot right now, they are could easily make the playoffs. So I, I guess that's good for the CFL, right? I like it. I mean, I, you know, I grew up, I was born with the CFL. So, you know, I love it. I mean, you have to remember too, there's only nine teams, so <laughs> there better be parity, but um, you know, but you, I mean, anything can happen and that gives us, that gives us hope as, as rider fans. Right. So Edmonton can, can get back into the game. Calgary can get back in the game. Winnipeg can get back in the game. I mean, they, they didn't play well at the start of the year either. So yeah, you can, you can turn it over and that's why you, that's why you have 18 games and parity is fantastic. I mean, the games have been great this year. All right, well, let's start with uh, the Battle of Ontario. Ontario. Um, Hamilton and Toronto uh, should be a, a pretty feisty one, at least. I know uh, anytime these two teams get together, it's it's pretty nasty. So um, we'll lead off with Jeff. What do you think uh, spread's going to be in this one? I think it's going to be Toronto by two and a half. I'm going to go Toronto by five and a half. 
I will go somewhere in the middle at three and a half. Should have went higher. Steve, uh, Price is Right rule, Steve wins. Uh, six and a half. Yes. Oh. Wow. See, that's funny to me because Hamilton's been playing pretty well lately. And, you know, going, I mean, they beat him last time, didn't they? Uh, yeah. Yep, they did. Yeah, yeah. And, they did. Uh, you know, it's not uh, like Beemo Field is that great of a home field advantage. But. Well, it opened at six and a half. In some places, it has fallen as far as three and a half. So, but that's what we play where it opened. So it opened at six and a half. All right. Well, I'll take I'm, the Argo in this one. I'm taking Hamilton. I'm taking Hamilton, uh, too. I'm following Steve. I, I'm following the Steves. I'm following Steves. I'm taking Hamilton. Following the Steves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does Jeff win if he uh, wins this week? One of those Piffles t-shirts. We can make something. <laughs> make it, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Saskatchewan and Calgary. Jeff, I think you're taking uh, Saskatchewan based on whatever it is anyway. So, um, What's the line, though? Hmm. Steve, do you want to guess on the line on this one first? We're going to go Saskatchewan by two and a half. I'll go I'm one and a half. I'm going to say Calgary by, by one and a half. It is Saskatchewan minus three. Huh. Okay. Opened. You can get it at eight and a half now. Calgary in some books is an eight and a half underdog. So this, wow. this one switched in a hurry. A ton of money came in on Saskatchewan. Well, if it was eight and a half, I'd probably pick the stamps. <laughs> nope, but I'm still taking the riders. I'll, I'll take, yeah. I'll take the riders at three as well. I'm going to, I'm going to go off the, off the chains. Lid. I'm picking a tie. I think the riders win by would. three points. The riders win by oh. three. Well, that's a push. That's that's a push. How do you uh, win? Yeah, the, I mean, how do you win with a push? <laughs> I think you just get your I money back. Essentially, <laughs> okay. yeah. I just get I get a four point uh, bonus on the on the season if I'm right. Four point bonus. Uh, <laughs> you so. You'll still. I'm taking the, the riders. Path. Yeah, exactly. I think the riders are going to cover that three. All right, uh, Montreal. Well, I'm actually, I'm actually going to Saskatchewan. There's no. No, way you said push. Saskatchewan. It's already written down. No. Yeah, 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 push. Oh, all you right, all right. We'll keep it. Yep. I heard it. Brett Lothar field goal for the win. Let's see it. I, I hope it doesn't come down to that stretch. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, please no. <laughs> How long you been a Ryder fan? We know it's coming down to the end. It always does. Yeah. Yeah. Try no, to... we're, we're gonna blow them up. Oh, I hope so, Jeff. Um, Montreal at Ottawa. I'll go with him. Or Jeff, do you want to take this one first? This is a game of the week. I like that. These two are a good game. Montreal at Ottawa. Um, wow. Ottawa by one and a half. God, I wanted that ding. I'm going to go <laughs> Ottawa by two and a half. And I'm going to say Montreal by one and a half. Two and a half. Montreal, two and a half. Yeah. In Ottawa, interesting. I get, a, I get a ding by by accident. No. Actually, and that one also has moved. Uh, you can get Ottawa at plus eight and a half in some spots. Oh, I would. I'd be in on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll I'll take Ottawa at. Uh, well, two plus two and a half for Ottawa. I'll take Ottawa to keep it close yeah, or win. I'm I'm taking Montreal on that one. I'm going Ottawa. They're at home. They're playing well. They haven't lost. I I agree. I think this is one where Ottawa puts themselves in consideration for first in the East, and I can't believe I'm saying that after all the crap <laughs> I talked about. <laughs> and, and actually, speaking of Ottawa, Jeff, really quick, what's your take on uh, the Red Blacks buying into whatever Bobby Dice is selling? Uh, I mean, it's great. I mean, they, yeah, I don't know. It's changed. I don't know what's changed there. Uh, like, you know, when, when you're in the East, the West doesn't exist. When you're in the West, the East doesn't exist. So I don't really follow them that much, but yeah, it's, it's an amazing turnaround when, when, you know, we, I was on a radio show you know, earlier this year and Ottawa was in first place or, or close to first place because Montreal sort of ran away with it. And I went, just uh, Ottawa. It's so strange to say that, but I mean, it's great for the league and it's great. And Bobby Dice is such a great guy too. So he's done something right. I don't know what he's done, but he's done something right. Your former teammate, um, Duke Ellingson has got to be pretty happy. I know he's a uh, color analyst over there in, uh, in Ottawa right now. So he's probably, probably loving the turnaround out there. Yeah, he will. He's uh yeah, he's a, he's a diehard, let's say rough rider fan. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and the final game of the week uh, could be another really, really good game here. Winnipeg at Edmonton. Both teams trending way up right now. Um, I'm going to say it's Winnipeg favored by four and a half. That's big. I'm going to say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Edmonton's favored by one and a half. I I'm going to go right in the middle of the two of you. Would you say Alex four and a half? Four and a half for Winnipeg. Yeah. Oh. I have to do math now. Uh, Winnipeg by three. Or that's the only thing he's going to get right, Jeff. It's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Also, this one moved in a hurry too. Edmonton is a plus six, uh, plus six, six and a half underdog. Hmm. There's money being thrown around in these games this week. That's good. That means people um, are interested. I, I'm going to take Winnipeg to cover that. Yeah, I got Winnipeg in this one outright. I think Edmonton's going to going to surprise us. I'm going to take Edmonton. New Steve talked me into it. I'm going to follow him with him. <laughs> I'm, um, as a Ryder fan, though, I'm torn on this. Which would we prefer to happen? Winnipeg to win and distance Edmonton out of, you know, away from the playoff spot or Edmonton win and us get closer to a home playoff game? I'm, see, I mean, and I, I actually hope Edmonton had... wins just because I never want to see Winnipeg win, but. <laughs> I actually had this conversation with uh, a couple bomber fans at the well, after parties of the banjo bowl. Um, and they talked me into saying that I'll want Winnipeg to win this game because with, yeah, a home playoff game would be nice, but also making the playoffs for the first time in a few years <laughs> would be nice. And if you can distance yourself from both Calgary and Edmonton by a full game each uh, this week, that that's probably what you want. So as I disagree. Much as, yeah. I, I disagree. Nope. nope. I say let's go for the home playoff game. Like, <laughs> why Why is you – know, Ryder fans are so – you know, you guys just – you guys suck. You know, why <laughs> – why, why do you want to just make the playoffs? Flipping that. <laughs> why do you want to just make the playoffs? Four let's championships go, in 115 I get years. It. Well, maybe that's the attitude we've got to change. You know, let's go I agree. for a home playoff game. Forget it. <laughs> Let's 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 hope when let's hope Edmonton wins and we win and we win out and we get home playoff done. Can that be yeah, the new other opening to the right. show? Can, can that suck. be the new opening to the show instead of the <laughs> let's go Rider Nation? It's Rider fans. You Rider suck. Fans suck. Yeah. No, I said you guys suck. Yeah, we suck. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start putting words in my mouth. I got in trouble for that once. <laughs> Pretty sure said Rider fans suck. I uh, we'll, no, no, we'll no, have to no, go to the no, tape. No, no. And it, it can't be us though, because Kurt Angle has told us we don't suck. So exactly. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but it's it's a good question because well, really, when you think about it, it's Winnipeg or BC. We got to catch one of them. I think there's a better chance of the Riders catching BC than there is Winnipeg. Just the way that things are trending right now between or with those two teams. So if they are looking we at lost, a possible home playoff, season, game, we lost the season series to Ed, to uh, Winnipeg. Yep. I think we still play BC once, right? So yeah, they still have BC at home. Yeah, so I, I think I think you're right. And BC has, I think, out of their five games, four of them are at home. So yeah, they need to. The only the only uh, the only way game is here. Yeah, yeah. But it should be. Uh, this is going to be a big week of uh, of CFL action. So hopefully, uh, we finally get some outcomes that we actually want here on this show. Um, who, and who then would have Jeff, thought that October 5th game in Edmonton would have been a potential playoff battle after the first five weeks of the season? True. CFL is weird this year. It's very weird. A lot of injuries and a lot of things going on, like a lot of losses and then a lot of wins and vice versa. So it's it's been a crazy year. It's been good. I mean, I think there's a lot of interest in, in the league this year. All right. Well, Jeff, if you win the pick them this week, um, you'd be tied with Greg, but – We'll give you the benefit of the doubt on this one. Um, if you happen to win, we'll get it. We'll get one of those piffle shirts out to you. You can bring it. You can bring it to. Cal oh, I guess we won't bring it. Be able to bring, bring it to Calgary because I'm going to win anyway. <laughs> okay. We'll send it out there. We'll send it out there. Next time we're in Calgary, we'll 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 do that. All right. so. Well, Jeff, 
thanks so much for joining us here this week on the Pivots Podcast. We love getting your insight, love your passion, still obviously watching the... I, I love how you still say we when you're talking about the riders. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a weird thing. I have nothing to do with it anymore, but I still I still feel like it's we. It's, you know, that's it's rider nation, man. It's just the way it is. I love the people, love the passion, love the team, and I hope we get a fifth great cup it's very soon. <laughs> Well, Piffles Podcast is brought to you by our great friends at Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and Sass Drive in Regina. Special thanks, of course, to Kathy Festian of Royal LePage Regina Realty and Churchill Brewing Company for their support in making the show possible. Thanks for uh, watching on YouTube or Sastel Max TV on demand. We appreciate that. And listening wherever you get your favorite podcasts, we'll leave you with Tyler Gilbert, Ghost Behind Your Mind. <laughs>